mantis shrimp illustrates the essential characteristics of this brand new predator class of animals. Superb vision, great speed, and superior size. Like Anomalocaris, it's considerably larger than its victims. It also has extremely acute vision, with 12 different types of color receptors in its eyes. We have just three. And it's one of the fastest animals alive, some species striking with the speed of a pellet from a gun. It's unlikely that Anomalocaris was quite as fast, or that it saw its prey so clearly. But nonetheless, it was a formidable predator, just as the mantis shrimp is today. Even a glimpse of a finger through glass is enough to make this animal strike, and with alarming force. So, why did the mantis shrimp evolve in this way? Well, obviously, in order that it could bum out fox and outmaneuver and eventually catch its prey. It's become very fast, very powerful, and capable of great patience. And those are characteristics of predators everywhere. So the fossilized remains of Anomalocaris are evidence that hunting had begun in the Cambrian. And as predators became bigger, faster and stronger, so their prey had to develop increasingly elaborate defenses. A Probinia's five eyes helped it spot trouble. And Hallucigenia protected itself with those spines along its back. One of the world's leading experts on the Burgess Shales, Dr. Jean-Bernard Caron, believes that it was the arrival of predators like Anomalocaris that stimulated the great Cambrian explosion of diversity. It is during the Cambrian that we can start seeing animals with legs, eyes, swimming. This didn't exist before, and uh, this evolved very, very quickly at the beginning of the Cambrian. But once you have a big predator, presumably the rest of life, which it was feeding on, had to evolve quite fast to develop some sort of defences. Would that be true? Well, we think that this evolution occurred relatively quickly because in a, in a place like the bird shell, you find organisms that may have um, had some kind of defensive mechanism, which is thought to be a response to higher predatory levels. Arms race, if you want, between predators and prey. One result of this duel between predators and prey was the development of armour. Animals everywhere were absorbing calcium carbonate and other inorganic substances from the seawater and mineralizing their bodies. Many of them, like Wewaxia, that early mollusk, and ancestors of the squid, ammonites, developed protective shells. But one group, the arthropods, which had jointed legs, encased their entire bodies with hard armor plating. And what began as defensive armour, necessary for survival, brought with it another great advantage. Hard parts can be used not only to give protection, but to provide support for a body. Aha! <laughs> this spider crab is a crustacean, and it secretes chitin from its body, which it then strengthens with calcium carbonate. And a whole range of creatures have skeletons like this based on chitin. Arthropods today include shrimps, lobsters and crabs, as well as land-living creatures such as millipedes, scorpions and insects. But the ancestors of all of them 
first appeared in the Cambrian Seas. Over 50% of fossils in the Burgess Shales are arthropods of one kind or another, but one family was particularly abundant and varied. Just across the valley from the quarry, near the summit of Mount Stephen, almost every rock you turn over contains their remains. Here, they're found all over the place. They're called trilobites. Trilobites because their bodies were in three sections. Here on this slab, there are several of them. That's the head, there's the middle bit, and there's the tail. One, two, three. Trilobites. Trilobites at this particular time, right at the beginning of the Cambrian, began to proliferate into all sorts of forms. These creatures, for the next 250 million years, were probably the most advanced forms of life on this planet. To see how advanced the trilobites eventually became, I'm going to North Africa. In Morocco, on the southern flanks of the Atlas Mountains, the hills contain an amazing variety of them. They were only discovered a few years ago, but now the demand for them is so great that digging them out has become a major industry. These rocks, which were laid down about 150 million years after the Burgess Shale, also contain trilobites. The trouble is, the rock is very hard and the trilobites are quite rare. But when these people find them, their specimens are absolutely extraordinary. Some species have features that are so delicate that it can take days, sometimes weeks, to fully prepare a specimen. Skilled technicians use dentist drills to get down to the finest detail. Every particle of rock must be carefully removed with enormous patience and absolute precision. The end results reveal that trilobites moulded their external skeletons into an almost unbelievable variety of shapes. And that enabled them to colonise a great variety of habitats just as modern arthropods still do today. There are about 50,000 different trilobite species that we know of, and doubtless there are still many more to be discovered. Their hard exoskeletons not only ensured their abundance in the fossil record, they also tell us a lot about their owners' lives. Many of the trilobites that are found in these cliffs are curled up, like this one. Sometimes even more tightly than this is, with their tail tucked underneath their heads. And it's clear that this was some kind of protective posture, just as it is for some kinds of wood lice that you find in the garden today. That protected them against their enemies. But there are so many that are curled in these deposits, together with others that have their backs arched upwards and others in other strange postures, that it seems that they are the victim of some kind of catastrophe. The sea floor, it seems, was quite steep. And every now and again, the mud that accumulated on the bottom slipped down in a submarine avalanche, carrying the animals that lived in it and on it, higgledy-piggledy, and burying them alive.
rock and trilobites are big business these days. Particularly rare species sell for thousands of pounds. The world's leading trilobite experts, such as Professor Richard Forty, come here to study these extraordinary animals. He believes that their external skeleton was the key to their success. The trilobites did almost everything you possibly can do with an exoskeleton. I think that skeleton was what gave them an advantage. They were protected. They could do all kinds of interesting things. They could grow spines. They could get flat like pancakes. They could protect themselves by getting thick exoskeleton with pobbles all over it. It was a great advantage to them, just as it is to crabs and lobsters living today, which of course weren't around in the, at the time of the trilobites. So they utilised the virtues of having a tough exoskeleton uh, to radiate into all kinds of ecological niches. You can see one of the most comprehensive collections of these trilobite fossils just a few miles from where they're quarried, at Erfood Museum. The collection here reveals just how varied the trilobite skeleton could be. There is no question that an exoskeleton gave the trilobites protection, but it also gave them something else of great value. There must have been many reasons why trilobites were so successful, but one of them unquestionably was their power of sight. They had eyes, not just eye spots that could tell the difference between light and dark, but complex eyes that could form detailed pictures of their surroundings for the first time in the history of life. Eyes like these. Most animals on Earth today have eyes of one kind or another. Most are made from soft tissue, as ours are. But trilobite eyes are unique. Their lenses are derived from their mineralized external skeleton. They're made of rock. Each one of these little dots is a lens, and each is made from calcite, a crystalline form of chalk. Trilobites were the only organisms ever really to use this stuff as their lens material. And in doing so, they evolved very sophisticated vision indeed. For example, these sorts of trilobites had very large lenses, and each lens is readily visible with the naked eye, and each one is biconvex. And it's been proven that individual lenses had little bowls inside them to help them focus more precisely. These creatures were among the first certainly, to, to actually focus a picture, weren't they? It wasn't just a question of telling light from dark. They could do better than that. Oh, no, these, these had really sophisticated vision. The kind of trilobites that have these eyes were probably hunters. Some people have claimed that they could form stereoscopic images using both eyes, so they could really home in on the prey. Many predators today, including ourselves, have 3D or stereoscopic vision. It makes it possible for a hunter to accurately judge the distance between itself and its prey. But not all trilobites were predators. Some were inoffensive creatures that lived by munching mud. But sight must have been valuable for them too, enabling them to spot enemies in time to escape. There are trilobite eyes with more than 5,000 lenses. 5,000? More than 5,000 lenses. Now, and each of those does it have an image? Each of those doesn't have an image, but if they go for lots of tiny lenses, they're particularly sensitive to movement, i.e. something changing between one lens and the next. This trilobite's eyes are so big, they extend right round its head and meet in the middle. And that suggests that the animal swam higher